worship. Grace to you and peace from the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Grace to Jesus, the faithful Jesus, the Lord of our souls. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. To the one who loves us and who frees us from our sins, to God be glory. Amen.
Well, we are not in the Gospel of Mark. We're in a different Gospel. And we're in the Gospel of John. So, remember our Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, then John. Yes. They were all disciples of Jesus Christ. And they wrote about their experiences with him. And so, today, we're, we are in John chapter 18, way back in there. And we're talking about Pilate, Pontius Pilate. We have this thing called an Apostles Creed. And it says in the Apostles Creed that Jesus suffered under Pontius So, when we think about Pontius Pilate, he teaches us some valuable things. Yes? Well, Pontius Pilate was the first part of Jesus' crucifixion. And so, what happens is, is that Pontius Pilate, he's the judge. He's the one who listens to the case. Like when people go to court, we hear about that. And so Jesus stands before Pontius Pilate. Pilate doesn't think that he's guilty, so he sends him to King Herod, and Herod sends him back. And then the crowd yells. He wants them to excuse him, and they say, no, let Barabbas go. And so Jesus is crucified. And that's how that happened. But thank you for asking. So when we, when we stop to think about it, he asked, Pilate asked Jesus a question. And the question was this. Are you the king of the Jews? Now, what difference would that make? You know this? Jesus was king of the Jews. He couldn't be king of the world because he can only be king of one thing. Okay. Well, in order to be king of everything, you can be king of the Jews too. Oh, Jesus was a Jew. Yes? what that means, that Jesus is king of the Jews, that means that Jesus has a kingdom. And guess where his kingdom is? The kingdom, well, no one says the kingdom is with the Jews, but Jesus tells Pilate that his kingdom is not here on this earth. His kingdom is with
You just never know what you're going to get during children's moments. I love I'll tell you. Our scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of John, the 18th chapter, beginning with verse 33 through 37. Hear now God's word. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again and summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. God, you are holy, and your kingdom is not of this world. Help us, Lord, to quiet ourselves, to hear your word speak to us, and to follow in amazing ways. Amen. This is Christ the King Sunday. And if we were to testify to the truth and ask this question, what do you think your answer would be? Is Christ your king? Is Christ your king? We all know that there are different kingdoms. UK has a kingdom. There are different places that have kings, queens, squires, an order of such. However, our perception, our perceived ideas about Jesus does not change the truth. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He became flesh and he dwelt among us, the only only sinless man in history. Because the rest of us all inherited Adam and Eve's sinful nature. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Christ, the sinless man, obeyed. And he is his purpose was to come and to restore us into right relationship with God the Father. You see, it's ironic that one would obey an earthly king like Caesar Augustus and refuse to recognize Jesus as the king of kings. And even worse, to allow him to be treated like a criminal. Jesus submitted to the will of the Father and he endured God's judgment of sin in order to save you and I. But then how do we really discern truth? And how does truth form you and I? Let's look at some things that that can help us. Have you ever written a statement of faith? There have been several times that I have been asked to write my own statement of faith. The things that I truly believe in. The first time was when I was in junior high, and I was going through confirmation class. We used the Apostles' Creed, we opened it up in the hymnal, and and we looked at it. I believe in God the Father. Hmm. There are other faith statements in the Apostles' Creed. 
Several times, though, I have rewritten or thought about the things that I believe in, in my faith. The next time I was asked in a Bible study class to write my statement of faith and to share it. And then, when I went to seminary, I was asked again to write a statement of faith. Pretty soon I thought to myself, well, you know, the computer's a great thing. I can just copy and paste that. And I very well could have done that. But I didn't. Because I think it's worthwhile looking at what we truly believe in. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, incarnate, fully human, fully divine? It takes faith to believe that, because we all know that that is not the way that you and I or anyone else that we know came into this world. How did that happen? Do we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit? We have some serious questions to ask ourselves. Do we believe that God created everything around us? Well, you see, a statement of faith is no light thing. And you're probably thinking that doesn't have a whole lot to do with today's scripture text, but it does. You see, we read that Pontius Pilate played a role in what happened in Jesus' life, and we also know that Pontius Pilate is mentioned in the Apostles' Creed, like I said to the kids. The phrase, suffered under Pontius Pilate, is used and translated in more languages than almost any other name. Pilate's name is known to more people in the world than most great men in history. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty amazing. So what can we learn from Pontius Pilate? Pilate had a middle-class upbringing. He served the Roman army in Germany while on a long stay in Rome. He caught the affection of a Roman girl named Claudia Procula, P-R-O-C-U-L-A, and she is the granddaughter of Caesar Augusta. And because Pilate was given a position that he otherwise would not have had, he was allowed to take his wife with him, which was a very unusual circumstance, and never allowed before. Pilate, as governor of Judea, was in charge of administering all aspects of the Roman law. He was head of the judicial system. He collected taxes. He allocated the providence for the money that was spent in the providence there. And he sent taxes to Rome. During this time in Palestine, there were many problems. Because of the stubborn resistance by the Jews toward the Roman captors, there was constant rebellion and unrest. The governor of Judea was not only not a highly sought after position, but he was still able to live in a palace with servants and soldiers at his side. And he had to deal with all kinds of problems, including keeping peace among the Jews were a rowdy bunch. At the time of Pilate's encounter with Jesus, Pilate was in the political hot seat. He was there a lot. He had several protests and riots and had been called to Rome by Caesar, and he let him have it. He felt his wrath. He couldn't afford another insurrection. And to make matters worse, when the Jews wished to fulfill punishment of the law on their people, especially a death sentence, guess what? They had to go to Pilate for the Romans to carry out the sentence. And that's why the religious leaders bring Jesus to Pilate on that fateful Friday morning. 
they know that his back is against the wall. And Cephas uses that force to make Pilate make a decision. Pilate's struck between, um, he's stuck right there between a rock and a hard spot. They want Jesus punished, yet Pilate interviews him and he says, the man's innocent. So Pilate's decision will determine whether he gets to keep his job and make his wife happy because she thinks he's also innocent. Or, or, he will be pulled from his job. So what is it exactly that we can learn from Pilate? First, Pilate refuses to stand up for justice. He's more interested in looking out for his own interest rather than that of an innocent man. Friends, we have to be concerned for one another. We have to stand up for justice. Luke and John tell us that Jesus admits to Pilate that he is, he is the king of the Jews. But he also tells them that he's of no threat. It's not a political kingdom. It is a spiritual kingdom. It's not physical. On hearing that testimony, Pilate goes back and he tells the leaders, there's no basis for a trial for this man. But there are accusations. And they continue. When Pilate learns that Jesus is from Galilee, he passes passes him on to Herod. But Herod finds no fault with Jesus, and he takes him back, and he's back in front of Pilate. So Pilate says, well, what we'll do is we'll give Jesus a good beating, and that will make all the people happy. And they do. But the people still aren't happy. And so the day comes... And Pilate goes to the crowd and asks them to choose between Jesus and Barabbas, thinking surely that they would free an innocent man over a hardened criminal. But to his dismay, they choose Barabbas. Set Barabbas free. Wow. And all of this, Pilate is trying to live up to his wife's request to leave that innocent man alone. But instead of taking a stand for Jesus, he bows to the will of the crowd. You know, it's really so much easier to let others decide a person's fate than it is to speak up on someone else's behalf. Isn't it? And yet... That's exactly what you and I are called to do. Psalm 33, 5 says, The Lord loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of his unfailing love. And Zechariah 5, 9 says, That this is what the Lord Almighty said, And minister true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Friends, This pandemic has helped us to understand what is right and what is just, and that we are not here for just ourselves, we are here for one another. Aren't we? We need to take a stand for justice and righteousness. Second, Pilate refuses to seek the truth. What did Jesus say? He said, I am the truth. I am the truth. Jesus said to Pilate, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth, Jesus says. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Pilate answers Jesus with a question. He says, what is truth? Friends, what is your truth? Scripture says that he went out to the crowd. Right there and then, Pilate had an opportunity of a lifetime 
to discuss with the teacher of truth, of all truth. And it would have influenced him and it would have helped him for the rest of his life. Instead, he throws out this philosophical question, a question that shows that he's really never, ever wrestled with his own faith. He doesn't know what he believes, and he just leaves it at that. When Jesus speaks truth, he's not talking about any truth or one person's idea of truth, but he's talking about an absolute, universal, unalterable truth. And with Jesus, with this, Jesus gives Pilate a tremendous opportunity, an opportunity to take a stand in a position of truth rather than an opportunity to listen to opinions of Cephas and the Sanhedrin, a truth relative to them, but it's a truth that they are trying to impose on others. When Pilate asks Jesus what is truth and then he leaves the conversation, he does what many people fail to do and think and wrestle with truth and what we really believe. Too many Christians fail to put the work not only into seeking the truth, but to understand why you believe what you do. What makes truth for yourself, but just for all people, in all circumstances, and in all times? We have become people who want to be spoon-fed our faith and told what we believe, but we don't want to do the hard work of wrestling with our faith. Do you remember the first time that you heard about the Immaculate Conception? I don't know about you, but I was all ears. How in the world did that happen? And what about our sin nature? And what about creation? I had lots of questions. When my dad died, I was angry with God. I was embarrassed to tell people that. What kind of a God allows the Son to die on a cross for people that don't even care about other people? I asked that question, and you know what happened? God called me into ministry. Be careful what you ask, because God is faithful to answer. But I had to look. I had to search. Because it was love that held Jesus on that cross. We have become people who want to be spoon-fed. Friends, it's much easier to just accept what we're told or what to believe. But we never put it to the test. But I can tell you, life is a big test. PleaseConvinceMe.com writes, In our search for answers, sometimes we ask the wrong spiritual questions. If the question is simply, how can I find happiness, satisfaction, or purpose? Well, there's a number of ways, and most of them are temporary. There may be ways that I can make a spiritual effort to be happy or satisfied, but happiness and satisfaction are really secondary questions to the most important question. What is the truth about the existence and nature of God? Do you know God's characteristics? Do you know how he has acted or responded over time? The Bible is very clear. Personally, it says... I'm not interested in simple happiness and satisfaction. I'm interested in the objective, absolute truth of God because only this truth has long-term significance. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What does that mean for you and for me? The third thing is, is the pilot fails to make a decision for Christ. Here he is, he encounters Christ, the truth of all truth. And let me just tell you this, truth demands a response from you and me. Pilate tried to bring forth more and more truth, which in turn weighed on his conscience. Jesus answered those questions by talking about the real source of authority, which is God, not Caesar. Jesus talked to Pilate about the nature of his kingdom, a kingdom not from this world, but from heaven above. He talked about two kinds of people, those on the side of truth and those opposed to the truth. Pilate progressively realizes that there's something highly unusual about Jesus, In turn, we must recognize that Jesus gives us, you and me, the same opportunity that he gave Pilate. So the question is, will we respond like Pilate and flippantly challenge the notion of truth? Or will we embrace that which is absolute, unalterable, and regardless of our denials, a way to redefine what is really the truth. Jesus is presenting you and I with a decision. Are we going to decide to believe in him and follow him? Or are we going to be a fan of Jesus and really not follow? You see, a fan stays in the seats or the sidelines and they never get in the game. Kyle Edelman writes, a fan is an enthusiastic admirer, but Jesus is never interested in enthusiastic admirers. He wants completely committed followers. He wants more from us than a raised hand or a prayer that we repeat over and over and over. He's looking for more than just fans. He wants you and me to follow him, to allow yourself to die to your old ways, to pick up the cross and to follow him so that you can be a new creation in Christ. You see, fans never fully commit to Jesus. Instead, they're just content to sit on the sidelines without focusing on the mission and the values or the heart of God. Friends, we share Pilate's dilemma. Do we stay on the sideline or do we get involved? Like Pilate, we must answer two questions. The first one is, who is Jesus? Is he just a good man? So there's really no reason to commit to him. Or is he who he says he is? The Son of God, who died for our sins. If I believe the latter, then why wouldn't I want to give my life to him? And friends, once we decide who Jesus is, we have to answer Pilate's question. What will I do with Jesus? Will you and I try to evade him and make the decision to remain uncommitted? Or will you and I surrender to the Lord as the author of our lives? Will we surrender? And looking at this text, the tables are being turned before our very eyes. You see, it appears that Jesus is the one that's on trial. But friends, can you see it? It's actually Pilate that stands trial before Jesus. Pilate stands with the Son of God in those hours, and it is as Jesus is searching and probing Pilate's very soul, revealing his character so all can see it. 
But every, every soul, every one of us stands where Pilate stood that day, face to face with Jesus. And he's asking, he's asking for our decision. Amen. Thank you.